Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 352. The truth is out there. Fox Mulder. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by FilmTools.com. Since 1996, Film Tools has been Hollywood's one-stop shop for all things production. No matter what your filmmaking needs, Film Tools has you covered when you need gear for your next shoot. Anytime I need anything really quickly, I go to Film Tools. They always have every single kind of production nugget and thing that I might need. No matter how small or big it is, they definitely have it. And this week, Film Tools is offering the Indie Film Hustle Tribe 5% off all purchases at filmtools.com. Just use the coupon code IFHPOD. That's I-F-H-P-O-D at the checkout at filmtools.com. Today's show is also sponsored by the Make Your Movie Bootcamp. You want to make a feature film, but you have no idea where to get started. I feel you because that's exactly where I was years ago when I first got started. But I finally decided to stop talking about making a movie and go out and just do it. I want to help filmmakers break through their own fears and show them the secret sauce on how to make a profitable feature film. So I decided to put together the Make Your Movie Boot Camp and condense all 25 years of my experience into a two-day intensive. And in the camp, I cover how to flesh out your idea, the screenwriting process, finding money, crowdfunding, directing your film, post-production workflows, marketing, submitting to film festivals, film deliverables, self-distribution secrets, and how not to get ripped off by predatory film distributors. Think of this as a jumpstart to your filmmaking career and a replacement from a very expensive film school. This boot camp will be held in Burbank, California on October 26th and 27th at the Hilton Garden Inn in downtown Burbank. If you want to get 20% off the boot camp, just head over to mymbootcamp. Dot com. That's make your movie or mymbootcamp.com. So today on the show, guys, we have distributor Joe Dane, who is going to blow the lid off of this whole distributor debacle. In this episode, which is fairly epic, which comes in at around an hour and 40, hour and 45 minutes, we talk everything about not only how distributor went down, he proposes multiple questions about of what really happened uh, and how we could follow the money and so on to see what the hell happened with Go Digital Distributor. And we also discuss the much larger looming question of what responsibilities do the actual platforms have for this mess, you know, and, and what they're going to hopefully do and change things to protect not only themselves from being liable, but also protect independent filmmakers and mid-level and larger film distributors who deal with these aggregators all the time. We go into some very, very deep rabbit holes uh, in regards to Go Digital Distributor, film aggregators, and the distribution business in general. We also talk about what's making money nowadays, what's not making money nowadays in the distribution space, what things to look out for when dealing with a film distributor, and so on. It is a epic, epic episode without question. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Joe Dane. I'd like to welcome to the show Joe Dane, man. Thank you for coming on, brother. Thank you. Thank you for having me, sir. You, you, uh, you've, you've, made a, uh, you've made some noise on the Protect Yourself from Distributor Facebook group uh, recently, and, uh, and I have a feeling that you might be making more noises in the future after this podcast. Oh, don't, don't, don't doubt it for a second, my friend. Don't <laughs> doubt it for a second. I mean, listen, this, this whole, as I referred to it in my letter, debacle, uh, the letter that you, you posted on, on our behalf to, to aggregators and filmmakers, this has been, you know, for the, for the lack of a, of, a, of a more tasteful term, such a kick in the balls. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the things that I felt was so important to really address was the fact that this was not about a, an indie filmmaker service going under. Because as Variety initially launched and said, uh, which was on the, 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 the heels of your original announcement, mm-hmm. um, 
we are dealing with a much bigger problem here. And, and that is really what I want the dialogue to, to turn to. Right. And, and, and do I think it's important that everybody's, you know, working very hard to get their, their contact, you know, their, their, their content back from go digital and, and, and get it replaced. Absolutely. That's the immediate concern. And, and I understand that, that why everybody is, is focused on that, but that's not the dialogue that we should be having because to me, as far as I'm concerned, it's jumping out of one frying pan and into another frying pan. And that has to do with the lack of the financial assurances, um, that are not coming down from the platforms who are deeming these companies approved. Mm -hmm. So no matter who the company is, and listen, there's a lot of good companies. We're primarily now moved over to premier, right? Mm -hmm. Premier digital. They're one of the monsters in this business. They hold most of the major studio accounts, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They have been tremendous to us and in, in, in being able to facilitate something that probably not, not a lot of other companies were able to do, which was has been a actual backdoor asset change, right? Because we had so many films live, we've been able to accomplish most certainly with the help of, of, of Premiere and because of their influence and their connections, where uh, platforms like Vudu, uh, platforms like iTunes, um, Xbox, uh, soon to be Google play, instead of our content having to come down and be reavailed, they were able to reach out to the platforms on behalf and do a backdoor content switch so that those assets on the back end were literally just switched over to, uh, to from go digital to premiere. Mm -hmm. So that was a, huge, that was a huge, huge thing for us, right? Because so it hits bad as Right, right, exactly, exactly. So, but before we keep going, please tell people who yeah. the hell you are, because there's a lot of people oh. who just don't know who you are, Joe. <laughs> so, I know who you are, and people who've read your letter. I'm, I'm so invigorated by by getting this information out there that it's so so not about us. But I know. Tell us who you are. Uh, right. My name is uh, is Joe Dane, and I am the president of worldwide distribution for two labels, Terror Films LLC, which uh, is our genre brand at the quite a few people know about. And then we have a sister company called Global Digital Releasing, uh, which, you know, takes on sort of non-genre content. It's a smaller label than Terror Films, but they are sister companies. And it's the same team that operates them both. And, you know, we work, we're, we're if anybody were to look up the principles of the company, we're, we're independent filmmakers. We have written, directed, acted, produced, self-financed, executive produced, cast, edited. I mean, you name it, we've done it. We still do it. Um, my, my, my lead partner, Jim clock, he works all the time as an actor in huge stuff and, and, and happens to also act as our head of acquisitions, uh, because he loves it. He loves watching films. He loves connecting with filmmakers. And, and I'm the, I'm the business guy. I'm the guy that deals with the, the, the placement, the, the pitching, the, 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 the I oversee the marketing. We're very, very hands-on. Uh, we're not a, what I like to call a content dump company. And what I mean by that is if you were to look at some of the other mid-level, uh, distributors that you could maybe call our, our our competitors, you know, you're talking about there are some companies out there dumping 150 plus films a year onto the digital platforms. Oh, yeah. Now, by doing so, I understand the business model. It's a business model. I get it. And if it works for them, it works for them. But there's no way in hell those companies are dedicating any time or energy to the promotion and marketing of your film. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that makes our model unique uh, and not every, it's not for every filmmaker, but you know, we started out when we, when we, when we launched the label officially Terra films, which was the first label we launched, mm -hmm. we launched, uh, officially as a distributor in the last quarter of 2016. But prior to that time, what happened is we had, we had put three micro budget horror films into production with the idea that we were also going to handle our own distribution. And part of the reason that we did that is because we were new to the game as a distributor, but we also wanted filmmakers to, to, to understand, look, we're risking our own money. We're risking our own money on our own model, on our own distribution. Mm -hmm. And we don't expect you to just be like, oh, hey, who are these guys? Let me give them my film, right? Like we, we didn't want people to feel like, you know, we were just a, a bunch of schmucks out of nowhere saying, hey, trust us, right? Mm -hmm. and, right. And, and and so much of what we did in, 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 and continue to do is mold the model, be flexible about the model to put filmmakers first. And so when we first launched the model uh, in the last quarter of 2016 with seven films, one of which was Hell House LLC, which turned mm -hmm. out to be a monster for us, mm -hmm. um, uh, of those seven films, three were our originals. And we started out with a traditional model, right? It was 25%. It was sitting behind a certain amount of marketing dollars. It was sitting behind all the recoupables, pretty standard par for the course stuff. 
as we were into that model, I wasn't thrilled with it because we were not putting money in the filmmakers' pockets fast enough. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I know that's a crazy thing for a distributor to shocking. say, but that <laughs> shocking, right? <laughs> but so much of what we we continue to do is is try to maneuver around all the things that we hate about the distribution model, right? That that we've had our own bad experiences with. I mean, we're not just a bunch of executives, you know, sitting around taking your films. Like we're we're meat and potatoes guys. We're on the ground. We're raising financing. We're 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 doing all kinds of stuff to make our own films and our own projects happen. So we get what goes into this. And so this idea that that you as the filmmaker, you know, get the material created, write it, find the financing, produce it, deliver it, to be the last person to see a dollar never made any sense to me. Never made any mm-hmm. sense to me whatsoever. Also, too, what we never understood is why, especially today in the digital age, right, we're, we're what, 85% of the movies being made at all levels – all levels from 50,000 to 150 million are going straight to streaming platforms. Okay. Um, that's the world we're in right now. So how is it that most mid-level distributors are doing not a single ounce of online marketing? Mm -hmm. Why are they not taking advantage of any kind of online marketing, which by the way, is not very expensive to do to be able to reach tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people, uh, that might be interested in your independent content. So what we came up with in about sort of mid-2017-ish was we came up with what we call a partnership model. So it is a 50-50 dollar one revenue model. Now what that model really is is once you deliver the film to us, properly deliver, everything – we are going to polish up and create a great trailer. We're going to polish up and create a great poster. We're going to – Pay for a PR blast. We're going to, and this is all, by the way, this is all guaranteed in the in the agreement. This is not mm-hmm. just me, I don't know, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Talk about distribution in a minute. Um, this uh, we we guaranteed a minimum placement. We guaranteed paid paid ads on every platform link that goes live. Okay, so so we cover all those expenses. So anything that comes up once you've delivered. Minus a couple of caveats like, oh, the film's doing well. The filmmaker decides they want to put the film in Japan, right? And there's going to be a cost, the subtitle cost, right? And in that case, if we mutually agree, we'll front that cost and that'll be the only time we'll recoup something. Other than that, when your film, the minute your film starts making money, you Mm -hmm. get a check. Whether that is $100, that is $5,000, that is $10,000, it's $100,000, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Boom. Out the door, you get a check immediately. What that has done, and, and, and honestly, when we first introduced it, we had some of our bigger sales rep partners who, who would you know pitch us content. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They were with us, right? There was a little bit like – and we said, look, let's launch the model. The worst case is, is that people are going to have an inverse reaction to it, and we'll just keep the other model. We want to be flexible here. But it was our sort of attempt of, of trying something, right? Mm-hmm. And, well, the model blew through the roof because I think for – especially I should – and I should – Prerequisite this uh, season filmmakers who'd been there done that under the traditional model where they sat behind the distributors' expenses and the mm. marketing percentage and blah 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 and would take them a year if they were lucky to get a dollar. Um got it. They all got it. They got it immediately. And the other thing is our term is short, it's five years. Uh, with a renewable yearly, it's probably got to be one of the the, the shortest in in the biz. Um, mm-hmm. At the same time, we're flexible with rights. So let's say that you want to give us just North America. You want to hold on to your foreign because you want to go try and explore a foreign sales agent and see what you can do there. <clears throat> Great, go do it. If it doesn't work out, or if there's territories left over that your sales rep can't do anything with, come back, assign it to us. We'll launch it digitally, which is which is by the way the focus of our of our labels. It's, it's really, it's really big on the digital distribution. Mm-hmm. The same with, with hard goods in our, in our term sheet, it, it says you, you can keep your hard goods, go exploit them somewhere else. We actually work quite a bit with a, a company called screen team releasing who, who does picks up a lot of, of, of the hard goods side of it. And we coordinate with them all the time as far as, uh, 
excuse me, let me get that out of the way. Um, we coordinate with them all the time on the release. So again, it's one of those things where we're super flexible because that's the other thing. Why is a filmmaker, and I, I certainly never understood it, why am I giving you all my rights mm-hmm. for 15, 20 years? Mm-hmm. What the hell are you doing with my film for 15 years? <laughs> what the hell are you doing with my hot damn film for 15 years? Amen. Not a f- thing. Yeah. Excuse my language. Not a thing. Not a thing. It's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. Now, we love what we do. We're, 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 we're so invested in what we do. Mm-hmm. That this is why this thing with Go Digital chaps my balls so bad because it it's it's exactly what indie filmmakers are always afraid of, which is getting screwed. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's why I refuse to sit idly by and let everybody make this only about Go Digital distributor going under mm-hmm. because they're not they're not the problem. There is an industry problem, okay? Okay. And that is this approved – again, and let me, let me preface that word, approved, okay? Mm-hmm. Aggregators who go through a series of whatever the, the technical tests are to garner those aggregation agreements with the platforms directly. <clears throat> but here's the gag. There's, there's not a single requirement on the financial side. Nothing. Not one. Nothing. Nothing. And I confirmed this with with the 800 pound gorilla that is premier that they said, no, no, we 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 keep a we we have a client (laughs) trust where the royalties go that doesn't intermingle with our, you know, production or and or business accounts. But that's self-regulated. Right. And that's great. And I love that. And and, and I've seen somebody comment on 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 the, you know, protect yourself and distributor page. That's also an aggregator said the same thing. And that's fantastic. I don't care. I don't care if you self-regulate. I don't. I don't. That's not. That's not what I'm here to talk about. Mm-hmm. What I'm here to talk about is that the platforms who deem you approved and trust you and trust you with our royalties, okay, from not just filmmakers but from many, 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 many distributors of all levels, mm-hmm. you're entrusted with the royalties. Okay, platform. What the hell are you doing to ensure that if this company or companies are mismanaged? or there's fraud, or there's embezzlement, what are you doing to ensure that we're protected, that filmmakers are protected? And I think for the platforms to take the position that it's not their responsibility is nonsense. It most certainly is, because if you're telling me you won't pay me directly, that I have to use one of these companies, you tell me I have to. I'm sorry, you better talk to your lawyers because you're missing something because you are potentially liable. And, and, and listen, by no means am I suggesting that we turn on the platforms, right? I'm not, don't, no. don't, don't, don't take this as I'm saying. Everybody they, lawyer up and let's go, let's go file class action lawsuit against all the people. I'm not suggesting that. But what I am saying is that it's time to hold their feet to the fire. It's time to say, you need to get this right. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it so I'll use the analogy of uh, if a plumber, like if, if I'm renting a place and, and all of a sudden uh, I have a problem with my plumbing and the, the owner of the, of, the, the, of the apartment goes, this is my plumber. This is the only plumber you could use. And the plumber comes in and destroys my house. Who's, who's responsible? Who's re- you right. didn't give me any other options, you know. This is the you're the one that d- dictated what was going on. So you have to hold some sort of responsibility regards it. It's a very similar situation with these platforms. They are right. they're forcing not just us independent filmmakers, not just you mid-level distributors, but the studio system as well. These studios, uh, most of the big ones, all the big ones go through people like Premiere. I think Premiere has most of those accounts. They have most of, yeah, from as I understand it, they have most of the major studio accounts. Right, right. So you're forcing everybody to go. And you said something to me a while ago, which was really interesting, was like, you know, let's say tomorrow morning, Disney, Warners, and and uh, Lionsgate wakes up and just goes, you know what, man? I don't think this whole aggregation thing's really working out for us. I think we're just going to call up all the platforms and we're, we're going to do it internally, and we're gonna we're gonna submit to you, and we're gonna have a direct relationship with you. Do you think that any? Do you think iTunes, Amazon, Netflix is going to say no 
to of course not. Of Disney. Course not. They're, so they're immediately, immediately they're going to go, sure, whatever you want, Paramount, Warner Brothers. Of course they are. So right. these studios certainly have not only the money but the ability to set up their own in-house aggregation. Of course they do. Absolutely. Yeah, they did it with Post. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I mean, remember when Post was, oh, they had to go out to an external Post company? Now everything's right. done internally. Right. So, so, so this is what keeps bringing me back to this, this bigger problem. And, you know, for any aggregator, now I don't care if you're an aggregator that is strictly fee-based or if you're an aggregator that takes a percentage, okay? Doesn't matter to me. I don't care who recommended you. I don't care how good your reputation is. I don't care about any of that. I don't care if you self-regulate. What I care about is that the platforms need to do this. The platforms need to mandate this. And listen, all due respect to to all the aggregators out there, there was one particular, um, you know, on the the, because I've been obviously much more active now on your your protect yourself and distributor page. Mm -hmm. There was one aggregator that that responded to my letter that you posted. Mm-hmm. That mentioned the idea of, well, we can't be overregulated. This could put us out of business. Well, here's the joke. They're not regulated at all. There's no such thing. That, that almost sounded like to me something a Wall Street guy or a banker, big banker would say, oh, no, we can't, we can't have any regulations. We've got to be able to do whatever the fuck we want to do. That's <laughs> bullshit. It, there's no regulation. Here's the thing. I mean, that's. I mean, I hate to say it. Overregulated. Overregulated. There's no regulation as it relates to the financials. No, mm-hmm. not a mm-hmm. not a single thing. So there's no such thing as over regulation, over being over regulated. But with, with with that said, with that said, there are there's a difference between obviously the aggregators and the film distributors. When you go walk into a deal with a, a film distributor, there is hundreds, if not thousands, of film distributors out there that you could choose from, and it's your choice to do business with them, how they do business and everything. But the concept that you're talking about is aggregators. There's essentially five, if I'm not mistaken, companies. Yeah. That, We're are, talking, that, are, that are probably five or six that are actually approved, yeah. Right, there's five or six that are actually approved and then there's probably a handful of other aggregators out there who are, are doing this, but there's no regulation whatsoever. And it should, I mean, even if they're self-regulated, there should be some sort of rules put down by the, the platforms that say, you need to have fiduciary responsibility. You need to have a, 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 an escrow account. You need to do this, this, this. There should be some sort of, you know, insurance right. policy. If you go under that, there's something I don't know. Right, and and that, and that's and that's what that's what I keep coming back to is this idea that and 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 let's 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 take it back a step because one of the things I mentioned in my letter is the only platform doing it right, as far as I'm concerned, is Amazon Prime. Right mm-hmm. now, <clears throat> right. Prime, if and let's think about this, right? If you put Prime next to iTunes, next to Vudu, you know, they're they're very similar as far as the space goes, right? I mean, as far as their 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 worth, their value, these are multi billion dollar companies, right? These are not little mom and pop streaming sites, okay? Right. They are dominating the digital sphere. So why is it, how is it that Amazon figured it out? And iTunes hasn't, and Vudu hasn't, none of them else have as far as the direct payment. And look, I have no issue with the idea of having to use a designated delivery service. And in fact, we we need that benefit. We don't have time to be dealing with the uploads all the time to all these platforms. It's 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 to us at least it's incum- it's 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 cumbersome, right? It's too of much. Course. It's a pain. So the idea of having to use a platform delivery service that will handle the QC. <laughs> Coding, the delivery, the metadata, the art, whatever's needed, right? I'm fine with that. Here's your check. Thank you for the service. You're a lab. I appreciate your lab services. Uh, why the fuck are you collecting my money, right? Mm-hmm. And 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 are you even are you even prepared to handle that money? Do you have an accounting department? Do you have any kind of oversight? What are you doing if you're receiving tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars a quarter of revenue right. through your bank? It's a, it's the equivalent. It's isn't it the equivalent of because I own the post house. Isn't it equivalent of owning a post house? Someone coming into you, a client coming into you, and like we're going to edit your movie, we're going to finish your movie, and we're going to deliver your movie, and uh, and then we're going to handle all the money from the sales, and we'll just pay you out. 
I mean, it's, it's essentially the same thing. I mean, they, they're, yeah. a service, they're a service company who have now yeah. been given the power to get money and distribute it at their, at their leisure or at their, or the way they want to do it. There's no, it makes no sense. Well, and too, and, 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 and here's an interesting thing I'd like to address is that, is that what I've heard some chatter about on, on the pages and also from, from the mouths of, 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 of Glass Ratner. Oh well, this was, the go digital distributor was not a sustainable model. I don't know how they were going to do this and, and figure this out and blah 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 blah. And you, there's no money in it and blah. All right, let's let's have a reality talk about this. And I actually posted something on on the 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 page the other day. I did a little I did a little math test, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was like, let's talk about the math. Now I was privy to the fact that in 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 2018, go digital distributor had taken on about 1,100 new filmmaker clients. Okay, all right. Mm-hmm. Now, now let's talk about that. Now, let's say the minimum fee was fifteen hundred dollars, okay, for one platform, one placement, right? Yeah. Which is more, but let's say minimum. Let's just say it's one. People decided one platform, and it was fifteen hundred. Again, I'm, I'm I'm not being exact on the math, but let's say fifteen hundred one platform, eleven hundred filmmakers. Okay, let's go even. Let's say we got a flat thousand. Okay, that's mm-hmm. one point five million dollars mm-hmm. in revenue comes in. Okay. So let's check that off. Now they were an approved aggregation partner for Netflix. Now I can't speak for every single film that was, that was sent to them by Netflix. Like we were, which is how we met them, which I address in our letter. We were charged a thousand dollars now to Netflix benefit. They did not, we did not charge it. Netflix actually built it into our deal. So Netflix essentially paid go digital directly to, to do this. So now let's say if you're an approved aggregator for Netflix, Netflix is sending you deals every time they close a, a licensing deal. They're sending you a film, okay? Mm-hmm. What would you think would be a fair average per year from Netflix? A monster like Netflix. How many films do you think you well, would they were, they were they were the uh, – don't forget. They were the – they were a preferred vendor. So they were preferred. one of – they were one of two companies that Netflix right. – so basically Netflix drove all the, all the, all the clients to them. So right. I would don't say, and, and, and say don't, and, but don't don't say it's not only features. We're talking about shows too. Right, so let, let's say five hundred titles a year. This on the low side. Sure, five hundred titles. Thousand dollars a pop. Sure. There's another half a million dollars. Mm-hmm. Okay. Don't forget. Hulu, don't million. forget. Don't forget Hulu. Well, hold on. All right. Well, let's just. I'm, I'm again. I'm doing broad strokes here. Okay. So we got a hundred filmmakers. Fifteen hundred dollars a filmmaker. One point five million dollars. <laughs> You got $1,000 per film for every Netflix film. We're averaging 500 films a year is another half a million. Now let's talk about the accounting because after a certain time, after a certain time frame, you start to pay a $50 fee per quarter for the, for the accounting processing, okay? So $200 a year per film. Now last I heard, they had roughly 4,000 filmmakers under their umbrella, okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's knock that down to 3,000 at $500, at $200 a year. Okay, there's another six hundred thousand dollars a year coming in. How now? Now we're at what? We're at two point six million dollars in a year, and we're being rough on the estimate here, right? Very rough. Two points, right? Two point six million dollars in revenue that's coming in. Okay, between new filmmakers, between the Netflix aggregation deals, and between the accounting fees. All All right. right. How's that not sustainable? How's that not sustainable? If you had 20 people on staff making $75,000 a year, which of course they were not making that much, maybe a couple of high level execs were, but the grunt, the grunt people, the tech guys, the people, what are they, 40, 50, 45, 50 a yeah. year, right? Yeah. You haven't even taken a dent into that $2.6 million, right? Mm-hmm. So operationally, this whole idea that the model was not sustainable smells like bullshit to me. Oh, but don't forget they had a whole side business of encoding costs and closed captioning and QC. Sure. Oh, and, let's, and, and, let's talk about, and let's talk about the closed captioning. I don't know if a lot oh, of people know. We went God. through them. They charged it 5 to $6 a minute. They would go to they Rev. Were using, they were using Rev. they just go so to Rev. They, they were charging – they were getting charged a dollar, taking five dollars from you. So then they were profiting on top of that, right, with, with that – with a pretty huge markup. <laughs> oh, by the way, I was told – I was told by someone yeah. who will remain nameless 
uh, that I was like, oh, don't use Rev. We've been having problems with Red. It's just easier if we do it all ourselves in house. Yeah, of course. They of said course, that. Yeah. I was like, really? So, so let's let's go back to the money for a second. <clears throat> now let's ask ourselves. This company's bringing in a couple of million a year. They didn't have a huge staff. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. The office wasn't that big, right? Pretty reasonable sized office and for anybody who's ever been there, right? It wasn't like they had like I think they were three, paying I think they were paying like uh, 8,000 a month or something like that for that if I was to remember. Yeah. Like three floors of some massive high rise, no, right? No, it was I mean, a small they office. Had a, yeah. they had a pretty small operation, okay? So then I have to ask yourself, where'd the money go? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good question. Who had access to the money? Who had their fingers in the cookie jar? Now I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about a couple of hypotheticals right now, mm-hmm. and I'm not gonna accuse anybody of anything. Mm-hmm. But we're gonna have we're gonna have a hypothetical conversation. Okay. Let's talk about Nick Soros, the former CEO. Okay. Where's he been in all of this? Has anybody heard a word from him? Has he made a public statement? Has he jumped in on any of the pages? Has he offered anything? No. I wonder why. Ask yourself. I wonder why. I wonder, I wonder where he's been. Now, I wonder for all the times that Go Digital wasn't supplying accounting reports or proper billing statements or even, even invoices for services, which, by the way, we never got. I'll, I'll explain in a second what we did. Mm-hmm. I always thought it was strange. The accountant who was there, her name was Jill Johnson. I used to ask Michael Sorsen, the, the former, uh, now former, uh, head of business affairs. Oh, Michael's no, no, longer, Michael's no longer there. No, Michael's officially uh, – uh, as I understand it, everybody from, from Go Digital is gone. And that Glass Ratner and Glass Ratner's technical team, whatever the hell that means, is dealing with the content removal and whatever else they can deal with. This is what I heard. Okay. okay. And okay. I know for a fact from Michael Sorsen directly, he is no longer with the company, although he is still, I guess, assisting in some sort of transitional way. Okay. For how long and to what degree, I don't know. Gotcha. Now, <clears throat> for us, we always questioned, hey, why are we not getting invoices? Why are we not getting invoices for the placement for all these things? And there's always some sort of weird excuse about accounting. They were changing software. They were doing this. They were making changes, blah, 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 blah. At one point, they had another accountant in there. His name is Michael. I'm not going to give his last name. We had gotten to know Michael, myself and my head of operations, uh, Nick Lanier. And this guy, Michael, was always questioning the way accounting was working. He, he thought it was very odd that it, was, that, it, that it seemed so complex and overcooked. And, and, and he was constantly questioning and saying, look, this, is, this shouldn't be like this. this is, it's easier to run this. It's easier to, 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 to get this accounting department running smooth. Well, guess what? He got fired. When I asked about why he got fired, what I was told is that Jill Johnson got him fired for some reason unknown – and that she apparently went to Nick Soros and that uh, he was let go. Now, nobody gave any reason as to why he was let go legitimately. But in looking back, as I look back, if I have to start you know, reading the, the writing on the wall, if you will, mm-hmm. you, had, you have now a CEO that has disappeared from the face of the planet, right? He's not addressing this in any way whatsoever. You have an accountant who never provided any kind of statement or legitimate breakdown. You were at the behest of a dashboard that was only as good as the people implementing the actual information as it came in from, from, from the raw data from the platforms, okay? Suddenly, they had no money. Suddenly, everything was gone. Well, how did that happen? If you look at my math example... You, you put together the pieces of a completely non-existent CEO as far as since this has happened, an accounting department that was always broken, and suddenly there's no money. But when you put the math together, 
And you consider the fact, and let's think about this, you consider the fact that this company is still collecting royalties, right? I don't give mm. a shit what Seth at Glass Ratner says, okay? They are still collecting royalties. If your film is live under any platform, under them, as an automatic set until the platforms decide they're going to pull their heads out of their asses and stop it, the revenue is still going into go digital distributor bank accounts. Now, let's think about that for a second. Let's assume there's thousands of films still up under their accounts. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably sure it's a safe bet to say that. And let's say that per quarter, let's say, what, 2,000 films is still under them. And those 2,000 films are making $100 per quarter, total, $100 per quarter. It's nothing. Mm -hmm. it's 200, that's $200,000 a quarter. Still going into their accounts. Mm -hmm. Where's the Where's the money, gang? Hey, Glass Ratner, where's the money? <laughs> because we know it's still coming to you. We still know it's going to your good old clients there. Now maybe, hey, Seth, this is to you, baby. Technically, I don't think you work for Go Digital. You work for me. You work for the filmmakers because my guess is, is that right. your highfalutin fees are getting paid off of our backs. Prove me wrong. Tell me otherwise. Show mm -hmm. me the board of directors writing you a personal check for these fees. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I don't think so. So I call bullshit in all of this. <clears throat> and it's not only incredibly disheartening, let's get into legalities now, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so here we have a situation where I just learned from the original one of one of the one of the original investors, Go Digital Media Inc., which actually has nothing to do with Go Digital or Distributor. They're, they're, in fact, they're in their, they've been in their own lawsuit with them, but they were an investor many, 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 many years ago. And they've divested their interest. They're, they're not connected. They're, they've got their own heartaches with, with this. I know mm. for a fact they've been in a lawsuit with Nick Soros. Um, anybody can look up those legal documents. It's all public you know, access kind of stuff anyway. Mm -hmm. So I'm not giving anything that anybody can't research on their own. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I learned from them this morning that in fact now that they have uh, – put everything over to an assignee and that that assignee is going to start, you know, dealing with payouts. Now what that looks like and what that means to what extent anybody's going to get paid. I don't know. Um, it's just such a disheartening shit show, but, 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 but what I want to get into is this. So there's been a lot of chatter about litigation. There's been a lot of chatter about <clears throat> even trying to force them in, in, into involuntary bankruptcy, right? Which was a, which was a dialogue I was having very early on mm -hmm. with my team. And I, look, they're going to pull the trigger on their own bankruptcy soon. <clears throat> Maybe we can get them off of the past. But after talking to my my legal team, you know, and going through all the pros and the cons and the good and the bad, it, it just didn't really seem like a viable option, right? Now you have the potential of uh, litigation, right? And there's some chatter about a bunch of people getting together not to sue Go Digital. Let me get this straight. All you filmmakers listening. There may be everybody an opportunity to get enough people together to go after not just Nick Soros, but the board of directors. And I hate to say that because I know one of the board of directors uh, who I think is actually a pretty nice, decent guy. But <clears throat> this is not about anything other than business and and thievery and 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 malicious intent, because it's, and, and as far as I see it, that's what this was. Now, there also poses the question of if I'm not going to accuse directly, but if say Nick Soros was stealing mm. if he was stealing mm -hmm. and the board of directors knew it and they did nothing to remove him, right? Just what ifs technically if he was stealing All right. and if they knew and did not move to remove him immediately, that makes them complicit. Now, I hate to say it, if litigation came up and it forced them to open the books and there was an audit, let me tell you, the money don't lie. You follow the money. You follow the money. You <laughs> want to know who's being funded with the money? You follow the money, okay? And then you look at the timing of money that was probably being taken out of those accounts, what the timing was of that money being taken out of the accounts, who had access to be able to take the money out of the accounts. Who knew money was coming out of the accounts and didn't do anything about it or say anything about it? Who kept their head in the sand? I don't know. Again, I'm not saying that any of this happened. I'm saying it's food for thought. It's worth the conversation. Again, you just place it against the mathematical equation I gave you about incoming revenue mm -hmm. versus 
how the hell are they broke? <laughs> and the only thing I can attest to, and maybe this is me being, you know, East Coast Philly guy, right? Right. <laughs> you know, I had no, I, I, I had no idea you were from the East Coast. Sir. <laughs> I, I had no idea that you were from the East Coast. I thought you were born in Malibu, yeah. sir. Uh, <laughs> I didn't fall off the turnip truck yesterday, Alex. Okay. So to me, I start to look at the bigger picture and I, I, I start to put it together and I say, this does, this looks like, this looks like embezzlement. This looks like fraud. This looks like, this looks like somebody was milking the coffers. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And, and, and trying to get away with God knows what and, here we are. Here we are. And 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 look, because of all of this and whether or not anything will come of this from a legal standpoint, whether or not anybody will see any money, even a small portion, that remains to be seen. And what I would probably tell everybody, and we've actually prepped our own filmmakers. We've said, look, we're fighting tooth and nail. We're going to do everything that we can. But the truth is we want to prepare you for the possibility that quarter two and most of quarter three are probably gone. They're probably gone and we're probably not going to see any of that money. Now, you put aside the hit that gives a company like ours, right? We're a small yeah. company, handful of guys. That's definitely a, a kick in the balls. But I gotta tell you, I'm less concerned about us. Mm -hmm. What kills me, this, what makes me nauseous about this, what gives me knots in my stomach, is the fact that this is taking money out of the pockets of hardworking indie filmmakers who have families. Mm -hmm. They gotta mm -hmm. put food on the table. For some of them, they leverage their own you know, credit cards and bank accounts and everything else to make these films. So for some shitbag CEO or board of directors to allow money to be stolen out of out of the, the, the mouths of hardworking individuals makes me want to throw up. And, mm -hmm. and, and to be perfectly honest, I feel bad for none of them. And, and I can only hope that enough filmmakers get together and, and form a class action lawsuit and sue the shit out of them. And not that they'll even get anything out of it, but the fact that by, by forcing them into litigation, they're all going to have to lawyer up. And they're all going to have to spend thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to protect themselves from this nonsense. That that gives me some satisfaction that that might happen, right? Because mm -hmm. they should not have to go away quietly into the night and brush this under the rug through a, a, a bankruptcy, a, a Chapter 7 filing or whatever they're going to do. They shouldn't just get to do that. that, that they shouldn't just get to go home and, and get a good night's sleep because but, they hired Glass Ratner to take care of all this shit. Let me, let, me ask you, let me ask you a question. Is there any potential for – criminal investigations by the LADA or by the FBI if, the, if that goes into their uh, jurisdiction? I, what do you think? Know, let, me, let, me, let, let, me, let me get into a couple of things. Now, obviously, I'm not an attorney, so, so I would always say to anybody to you know, make sure that you, you talk to an actual attorney. <clears throat> but here's what I know. There's a few things. There's potentially copyright infringement, right? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, if they're holding on to films, they don't legally own the right to. And they're continuing to collect royalties. That's a copyright infringement. That, that's a federal law. That's a that's a federal law. So you've got you've got that as a possibility. You've got the possibility on well, their bankruptcy side. Hey Seth, I hope you're listening. Um, there's a few interesting things where you can contest as a creditor. Okay, and it has to be of a certain amount, but you can contest that if your royalties. And again, we're talking about forget about service fees here, right? We're talking about royalties. We're talking about money that keeps coming in. If you've had money that's come in the last four, five, six months, and, and it's recent, and they knew this was going on, you can you can probably contest having them not be they, – they, where, where you go to the bankruptcy court and you say, look, we need to discharge our credit, our, our the debt owed to us because this is malicious intent. They knew this was going on. Mm -hmm. And – there's a chance that the bankruptcy court, the bankruptcy judge could could say to to go digital distributor, oh no, 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 wait a minute. You don't get to wipe this particular debt clean because they can show just cause. And for us, I'll give you an example, and 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 we're talking to our legal teams now. We were provided a prelim, like an early prelim uh Q2 reporting that was very vague. It was it was well over a month ago. It was before the shit really hit the fan. It wasn't unusual for us to get that because a lot of times we would ask for something to give us a little view, right? Mm -hmm. So now we have something that shows exactly to an extent what they had had collected for us from a handful of platforms. 
And I can certainly use that to contest to some degree and say, oh, no, no, listen, why do they get to charge this off? Uh, they just they just collected these well, and they're, they're trying to blow this away. Now, again, there's another option. There's also the option of people getting together, you know, and I, I again, I've actually talked to a couple of people privately on I am from your page where enough people get together. They get a litigator who necessarily isn't going to take money out, out front but sees a bigger picture is going to take a percentage, right, 20 30 percent. I highly encourage it. If you can get enough people together, hell, you get somebody together and we might join you on that, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and let's kick these people in the balls. And again, not to say that we'll get anything from it financially, okay? But they deserve these people responsible. They deserve to be put through the ringer. And they deserve to lose more than a few nights of sleep, over this, and they deserve to have to go pay exorbitant amount of fees to some attorney to protect their ass from this stuff. Okay, that might be the only thing that anybody gets out of it. Now, that being said, let's go back to the source of the problem. Why are we here? Why are we here? We're here because the major platforms put us here. Mm-hmm. Let's make no mistake of that. It's a shitty thing to have to come. <laughs> It's a shitty thing for any executive at at any of these major platforms that might be listening or paying attention to any of the articles or anything going on. We are here because of them, because of their lack of financial regulation not being bestowed upon any of their so-called approved aggregators. And I use our own experience. And although we're lucky we're not doing anything from from a Netflix deal because that particular deal I referenced was only a two-year deal. Mm Mm-hmm. But this is this is a this isn't this is the 800 pound gorilla in the digital space, who said, "Hey Joe, we're going to build it into your contract that you're going to use Go Digital to deliver the film to us and co- and, and collect the royalties and disperse to you for us." Okay, great. Yeah. Great. Now, now let me ask you, and I said again, I said in my letter, would you have questioned that? Of course not, because Netflix is Netflix. If Disney tells me to go do something and use this company, I'm going to assume that that company has vetted that cup co- that, that that company that they're telling me to go work with, and I'm safe. And that's just a general thing. The liability of the platforms is massive on yeah. on this. It is a massive thing on all the platforms that dealt with Go Digital, specifically the the big ones that have said this is the only guy you can use or preferred vendors and that kind of thing. It is on them because yeah. they're the reasons why we're here because if they would have been yeah. paying us directly and just use these guys as service, which is fine like I said before, like you said before. I agree with you, man. You need someone to kind of a funnel to do it. Amazon yeah. doesn't. They figured it out, right. but but right. other, but the other platforms are like, hey, you know, Netflix doesn't want to deal with ten thousand filmmakers. I get it. I get it. Hulu doesn't want to deal with ten thousand film. I get it. Well, listen, and, and again, this is not about them having to deal with the filmmakers. I'm not even suggesting that, right? I'm not suggesting that suddenly, you know, <clears throat> iTunes and Vudu and Hulu or any of the major platforms suddenly open up the ability for every single uh, uh, filmmaker and even to some degree mid-level distributors have direct access to them. It's impossible. They can't handle it. I, I get it. I get that. Listen, I, I, I even had companies tell me, I had like Voodoo was one of them, that when I was trying to pave a direct relationship, they said, we don't have the infrastructure to deal with another direct partner at this time. Mm-hmm. Okay, fair enough. However, that's not my problem. I'll use one of your approved delivery services all day long. I'll even use some of them to pitch to you if you prefer that, right? I don't even care about that. What I care about is is that you're not sending my money to me after you take your 30, 40, or 50%, okay, which is a lot of money. These platforms are taking a lot of money, and then you're taking the balance of our royalties and sending them to a company that you've deemed approved – and you have set no financial regulations in place to protect us. But they're not. But they're not even a financial institution, they're, right? No, and, and that's what I'm. They're saying. not regulated. It's it's ridiculous. But 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 what I'm saying though is that the platforms could regulate. They could say, listen, you have to prove to us that you've set up a client uh, a client royalties escrow account that does not commingle with your business account. Uh, we're going to have to verify once a year that that account is still in good standing. Okay. Um, 
On top of that, which I mentioned in my letter, <clears throat> that the platforms could do very easily, which is to protect content owners, whether it's an individual filmmaker or a mid-level or a major studio. And on the back end of the platform's uh, database, instead of the aggregator being listed as the account holder, you list them as the delivery service on behalf of the content holder. And the content holder should be listed so that when something like this happens again, and trust me when I it tell will. you, it's it going to happen again, it it's going to happen again. When it happens again, now what happens is that we as the content holders can reach out to the platforms and say, hey, this is what's going on. And I'll give you an example. Amazon, who, again, they have been so gracious. I've been talking to them via email almost every other day. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. They're working very aggressively with us, but... <clears throat> Their big thing was because of their AVD direct accounts, right? Anything that we had under, under Go Digital's AVD accounts, uh, and we used them a lot, even though we had our own, we used them a lot because our dashboard was, was not as big as we wanted it to be on the international scope. Mm -hmm. So we were using them for a long time until our, until our own AVD account opened up. But here's the problem. Our films, even though I can prove that there are films and that we, we were assigned the copyright to, to distribute, they're under GoDigital's AVD account. So Amazon just goes, well, we can't, we can't do anything. You have to have them take them down and then re-deliver to us, right? That's a problem. Very much That's so. A mm -hmm. And let me tell you something, too, to go a step further. What I'm suggesting – is not going to be a huge inconvenience for these major platforms. It's not like I'm saying, guys, restructure the whole thing that you're doing. Now, listen, me suggesting, hey, why don't you set up what Amazon Prime has done, where, where the, the revenue is going to go directly to the content holder of Note, that might be a little more difficult. But in this digital age, really, how difficult could it really be? How difficult could it really be for iTunes or Vudu or Google Play or any of these major platforms to, to say you have to use an approved delivery service to deliver, but we're going to set up the, an account for the, for the royalties and the raw data to come directly to you. How difficult in 2019 with these major platforms could it be when a major platform like Amazon Prime did it well over a couple of years ago? There's, it can't be that it's not that difficult because there's so many different there's so many different accounts out there so many different you know my, my whole business is online so I have revenue right. coming in from thousands of different companies and they have thousands right. of other other people doing things from affiliate like affiliate like affiliates just let's talk about an affiliate marketing thing Amazon has the largest affiliate marketing uh, program in the world and that's yeah. we're talking about millions, millions of accounts where money goes directly into a bank account every single month and is tracked every per. So there's, I, I agree with you 100%. There's no way that these companies can't do that. They don't, maybe don't want to put the resources in. Maybe they like, ah, I'd really rather not deal with it. I'd rather be easier yeah. to do it this other way. But what this does show us is there is definitely a crack in the, uh, in the boat. There is a leak, a big one. Oh. Uh, absolutely. And, 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 and this is, and let's think about this. <clears throat> All of these digital platforms were taking anywhere from 30 to 50% mm -hmm. of the royalties. Okay. Which is no small amount of money. If you were to have every single independent filmmaker and every single mid-level distributor say, we're going to take our content off your platforms. You want to talk about a kick in the balls to the platforms and their revenue streams. Because let me tell you, their studio movies, the studio content, there's not enough of it. There's not enough of it right. coming out of the pipeline to support the infrastructure of these digital platforms. These digital platforms are dependent upon the independent content coming from the independent filmmaker and from the independent mid-level distributors like us. They're, de they're dependent upon it. So – as far as I'm concerned, they, they, they have a huge responsibility to this community, a huge one. And again, we're not even asking for much. I'm not even, I'm not even requesting something that is so outrageous mm -hmm. that it can't be accomplished by probably a few simple changes on the platform side. This is the, what I'm asking for is a very reasonable change and, and some accountability, man, some accountability. What, what, you, you took your money. You took your share platform. 
So now you're sending my share to some, hey, why don't you send all of it to one of your approved aggregators and let them delve it out then if you feel so trustworthy of them. I mean, How do you feel about that? I mean, it's it, honestly, it, and, and again, without getting into the details of the back and technical aspects of doing this, you create, uh, with, and, we're th- and it's not like you and me are trying to build this. We're talking about massive platforms with massive resources that any one of their guys could go in there and code what we're talking about within a week or two, a t- or a team of them can go in there and do it. You can submit a PayPal link. So get paid through PayPal. Right. You can submit your direct uh, deposit stuff for your bank account and get paid every every month and set these things up. This is not like manpower or woman right. power, person power to right. to be writing checks and right. mailing them. And those days are gone. And let, and let me tell you this: by doing that, right, <clears throat> it doesn't even affect the aggregation business because no. you still need, you still need to go to them to place your film. Mm-hmm to deal with the encoding and the QCs and all of that stuff. You still need to, to pay them those service fees. But then what happens, if anything, I would think that the aggregators would actually be on board for this too, because it no, suddenly it's, eliminates it's, this it's, massive strain from them. That you, massive, which, they're, which they're barely getting paid anything for in the first place. The joke, they're, they're, they're essentially a go-between, right? They're a go-between. They're, they're, they're a third-party collection account. That's all they are. Right. It's, it's no different than something like vintage or freeway, but at least those major collection accounts, they're bonded and you know, insured and everything else. Um, so it's sort of a joke. It's sort of a joke to, to, to think that what I'm suggesting is going to hurt anybody's business. If anything, this protects everybody by, by implementing a direct pay uh, uh, source um, to still keeping the aggregators in place to deal with delivery and in some cases even pitches where the where the platforms are sort of protected from the idea of being inundated by thousands of filmmakers wanting to talk to them or, mm-hmm. you know, so they could still be a go-between in that sense, right? Mm-hmm. But they should not be allowed to control our money. And, and, and this way it alleviates the accounting responsibility from the aggregators while at the same time protecting the independent filmmaker and the mid-level distributors and distributors of all levels, and at the same time relieving some potential liability from the platforms. Because I got to tell you, mm-hmm. I got to tell you, I mean, in speaking to my attorney, he was like, this sounds crazy. This sounds like there is liability on their part if they're mandating it, right? Again, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't something where we went out and found people on our own, right? We didn't go out and just find Joe Blow who called himself an aggregator. We ha- and some of these platforms, they list the companies on their own websites of who's approved. Where's your? You're going to tell me there's no. You're going to tell me these attorneys at these big major platforms see no holes in that? They see no liability. <laughs> if I sign a deal, if I sign a I mean, deal, if I sign a deal with Netflix for two million dollars for my movie, and it's spread out over the course of two years off the deal, so every quarter I get whatever half you know quarter million dollars or whatever it is every month or every every quarter, and I was told you've got to go through Go Digital. They're the ones that are going to do everything, and they're going to handle the payments. You mean to tell me that halfway through? They they just they go out of business and go through what's going through. That Netflix is not responsible at all for that. Obviously right. they are. Obviously they're liable. And for a small guy like me or or a mid level distributor like you, we're you know we're talking about tens thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars. But when you're talking about millions of dollars on a deal, right. man, some you know people might walk away with for fifty thousand dollars because they're like hey, it's not going to be worth it. But when it's three four million dollars you're owed. I promise you some attorneys are going to get involved. Well, and here's the other problem too. Let's talk about also what's broken about the aggregation side of collecting our funds. <clears throat> so all these people, you know, they say, oh, the model is, oh, collect 100% of your revenue. And, I, and, and let's put aside the- No, no, the in pro- profit, no, in profit faster. Don't forget, that was the tagline for distributor. In yeah, profit about, faster. Right. And, and, and let's talk about, let, let, <laughs> and let's for a second sort of extract the, the, the couple of, of them that charge a percentage, right? They don't charge you fees, but, but take a percentage for the life of the film. So the dashboards that you're given access to, right? You know, get access to your dashboards. See how your film's performing, blah, 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 blah. Well, guess what? Those dashboards don't mean shit. Those dashboards are up to they, – they're, the dashboards are property of the aggregator, not the platform. Those dashboards are only as good and as transparent as the data being entered as the raw data comes in from the platforms. So as the raw data comes in for your sales from any, any given platform, some accounting person – at the individual aggregation company has to then implement that raw data into your individual films dashboard. Right now, 
What if they're not doing that properly? What if they miss something? What if they screw something up? What if they're being lazy about it? And unless you demand the right to see your raw data from the platform, which, by the way, you have a right to ask for. Filmmakers Mm -hmm. know this. You have a right to ask an aggregator for the raw data from the platform. And they're going to give you some nonsense about, oh, well, we get these big reports and and, and it's all the films and we can't give that to you because it's got other films. Bullshit. They can extract the raw data title by title by title. Mm -hmm. I know it for a fact. Don't let them tell you that. If you are dealing with an aggregator and you want to see your raw data. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Which will show every single sale, charge back everything from the platform. Ask for it. They have to give it to you. Anybody who doesn't give it to you or gives you some excuse, I would question the accountability of that particular aggregator. Okay? So Mm -hmm. just know that. Fair enough. Now let's talk about distribution and independent distribution and and some of the things that that I actually plan on doing – When I'm out from underneath this mess, because I'm really working so hard with my team to not only pull our films, which are almost completely out from underneath this mess, and get everybody back on track while we're dealing, obviously, with our new releases. Sometime next year, I I actually plan on putting together a little workshop that is about the pros and cons of of indie distribution and the pros and cons of distributor versus versus aggregator. Mm -hmm. There are some differences, kind of one and the same in, in their own right. <clears throat> there are certain things to 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 not be afraid of. First of all, don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions about uh, what the distributor is going to do. Let's let's talk about distributors right now, not aggregators. <clears throat> if a distributor, if you're if, if is a distributor is interested in your film, and let's talk about North America just for right now, <clears throat> and they're yammering at you about how great your film is going to do, how much money your film is going to make, if they're giving you estimates. Mm. <clears throat> Now, some of them do. I know some of them. I've been on the other side of those phone calls as a filmmaker. Here's what you do. Once they've dazzled you with how much money your film is going to make. Say, that's great. That's wonderful. Do me a favor. Will you advance me 25% of those estimates? Now, what's going to happen is you're going to hear crickets on the other end of that call. Okay. <laughs> Let's say distributors offering you a legitimate minimum guarantee where they're paying you some sort of actual advance, then they're not putting their money where their mouth is. What they're doing is they're blowing a lot of wonderful sunshine up your ass because they know you want to hear it. They know you want to hear how great your film is and how much money they're going to make you. Right. Guess what? They don't know shit. They don't know shit because if we all had a crystal ball, if we all knew how films were going to perform, there'd never be a failed film. There'd never be a film that fell on its face. Never. Not once because we'd have the magical crystal ball, but we don't have it. Right. So the difference, too, between a distributor and a foreign sales rep, let's talk about that. Now, foreign sales reps will, in fact, have the ability to give you estimates, highs and lows. But those estimates are based on their experience taking similar films to the market, mm-hmm. having them to various territories. So they're coming from a very knowledgeable place of understanding the market, understanding what's being sold that's similar to your film. But even then, all all foreign sales reps, the best ones in the biz, they'll 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 be the little tiny – you know, thing at the bottom of those estimates of those highs and lows, they don't guarantee you that they're going to hit any of those, even the lows, right? They don't guarantee it, <clears throat> but it's a guideline and it's a, and it's a reasonable guideline. North America, North American distributors have no way of knowing what your film is going to make period. End of story. So unless somebody's offering you a nice fat check on the front side, they are talking out of their ass. And End would you story. and would you agree that in today's world that most distributors, you being a distributor yourself, you really have no idea how they're going to perform on these platforms because one one year, one year, you know, like iTunes, I, I don't know, I'd love to ask you a question. iTunes at one point was a good revenue stream for TVOD. There was a lot of TVOD, a lot of rentals, a lot of things. But nowadays, it's more SVOD and AVOD. And that could change well, next year. Who I'm, knows? And I'm not- and I, I'm glad you said that because that's exactly the case. And the truth is, is that a lot of filmmakers like their film on iTunes because it's kind of a prestige type platform. Yeah. But I guess it's a vanity. It's a vanity platform. It's a vanity it's platform. A vanity platform. Absolutely, Alex. Absolutely. And 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 they are not really the big revenue generators. It, we always saw that Amazon Prime was the big guy. Now, however, let's preface that. In the last couple of years, Amazon Prime changed their rev share model a couple of times, right? <laughs> and not not to the to the benefit of us. Sure. 
Because I think at some point, and if you remember for a short period of time, they had this Amazon uh, 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 Stars bonus program, right? And I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah. We were lucky that we had um, – I think the last time we saw, saw anything was back at the end of 2017. We had four films. What they would do is that they would evaluate films and at the end of the month, if your film – fell into whatever their algorithms were as far as performance went, <clears throat> they almost practically matched what you made. So we had a, we had an up, we had a thing in the, in the last third and fourth quarter of 2017, we had four films where they had performed so well that we ended up getting a 40 plus thousand dollar bonus check for those films. Can you imagine? Now, Somewhere along the line, somebody at Amazon was like, what the hell are we doing? We must be sending so much money out that they, they, they've they pretty much killed that as far as I can tell. We haven't seen anything since then, and we've most certainly had films since that time frame perform very well that did not get a benefit of an Amazon Stars bonus check. Unless it went into somebody's pocket. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But, but but the bottom line but the bottom line is is what you're trying to say is that these the things and before in the the olden days let's say the 90s or even early 2000s there was they were more stable ways of making money and they weren't changing so rapidly so like you could right. ju- you could justify the DVD market you could justify right. cable deals you could there was that but now things change it's, so rapidly that what was good in 2017 doesn't make any right. sense today so there's well, no way to broadcast right. and even to the point that the platforms i don't think have been able to keep up with the ever-changing ingestion of of, 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 con- of content from the consumer mm-hmm. but then to go back to this so so amazon was the big performer and, and they're still very solid at least for us mm-hmm. uh, i can say are pretty still pretty solid but the one who's on their heels from our side from our perspective can i guess can, our, can, can i guess yeah to be Yes, yes. Tubi TV, man. I got to tell you. And it goes to show you the ever-changing landscape of things. Because look, what happened years ago with things like TiVo, people got on the kick of, I don't want to watch commercials. I want to fast forward through commercials. No commercials, right? Right. right. Now you got all the streaming sites and subscription sites. Well, now we're at a point, too, where it's like, how many streaming sites can people afford? And And there's five new major ones coming next year. It's insane. So what happened now is something like Tubi TV, it's owned by AdRise, got super smart. And they started creating the AVOD platform. And and if you look at Tubi, just if you compared it from just a couple of years ago today, they're getting incredible content. They're getting big movies. They're getting TV shows. They're getting all kinds of Every, stuff. Everything is being That's, tossed on there. Everything right. is being tossed on there. That's right. People are tuning in because there's no subscription. There's no sign up. There's nothing required, and so what they do is they go, hey, uh, I don't mind watching the commercials because the great thing about Tubi also is they don't edit the content. There's no editing. It's not like it's not like going on to a big Scarf- major television. It's like network. watching Scarface <laughs> edited. Right. I'll go right. fudge yourself. Fudge yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't do that. They don't do that, and, and, I, and I think that that's also been a big part of their success, success. as far as what I can tell. So I got to tell you, we push Tubi TV from a promotional standpoint all the time, all the time. We push the hell out of that platform. And also, too, they're expanding uh, around the world. It was that they were limited to to North America, but now they have an app that's starting to open them up to countries all over the world. So I think they're going to become a real contender. I also think that you look at something like Voodoo's division. Uh, Voodoo has a, a division called Movies on Us. Same thing. Where you're not paying, it's, it's commercial based. Avod. Avod. I'm got. I got to tell you, Avod is something for everybody to be paying very close attention to because it is. It is really becoming the next, I think, big thing. Which is funny because it was what was people were phasing out years ago, which was I don't want to watch commercials. Is now having a comeback because people are going. I can't afford to have ten different streaming site subscriptions, right? So, so it's this really interesting thing where where one of the things that we do as an indie company is we're always trying to pay attention to the landscape of these things. Is what's changing in the platforms? What are the new platforms coming up? And I think that the thing that we we do that that I I don't think enough independent distributors do is that we. Of course we play with the majors. Of course we put the films on the big platforms. Of course we do because we want to take advantage of, of our marketing ability to reach their, their fan base and their consumer base. But at the same time, we pay very close attention to, to, to the up-and-coming platforms. I'll give you a couple of examples. We started doing business with iFlix uh, several years ago. They're, they're, they're a company that's Small. more like Pan, Pan-Asia and it, it's, it's, it's mobile stuff. And when we first started with them, we were seeing quarterly reports – Couple hundred bucks, couple thousand bucks. Cut to almost two years later, 
we started to see quarterly reports twenty, thirty thousand dollars a quarter because the platform had just started to really take wind and really build. We work with companies like Seed and Spark. We take a look at all kinds of new companies coming up because here's what I always say to people. Nobody saw Netflix coming. Nobody knew they were going to be what they became. I remember when they were the little DVD kiosk company, yeah. right? Yeah. The, 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 the Hollywood videos, the blockbusters, the studios laughed at them when they got into streaming. Ha, ah, this little company, this crazy little company, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who's left now, right? And so for us, our job is to pay attention to all of this. Who are the new platforms? Who's coming up over the horizon? What have they done to sort of build up an infrastructure, to build up an audience base? What's their rev share model if it's not transactional, if it's based on hours viewed? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Right. And we're placing, we take chances with these companies all the time. Some of them work out. Some of them don't. There's been companies we've done business with that fell on their face just because they couldn't build the, the consumer base. But we would be we would not be doing our job if we were not paying attention to these platforms at all levels because you you never know. You just don't know what's gonna catch wind, what's gonna catch fire. And so it's very important for everybody. But you know, coming back to the independent filmmaker, here would be my suggestion to be perfectly honest. <clears throat> the downfall of aggregation is 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 a few things. One, there's no financial assurances or guarantees. Mm-hmm. Two, in most most cases, if not all cases, maybe one or two, they don't promote, they don't market, they don't even offer like an a la carte sort of marketing package, right? Because they don't know. It's so hard to right. market. You really have to understand right. it. <laughs> right. So what I would say to any filmmaker out there listening, open up your own AVD account on Amazon Prime, okay? Do that directly. Then all the money that you would have paid to an aggregator to place for you and do nothing else and collect your money, open up your AVD account and then go hire a small marketing company. Go hire a digital marketing company. Spend that $1,500 on hiring a Haibu or some other kind of company that specializes or small PR firm. I'm going to give an example. There's a great PR firm called October Coast PR. Um, very reasonable to help you get reviews, help you get your film out there, get the press out there, drop the trailer out there, do the things that you don't necessarily have to do. Now you're talking about smart money spent, right? Now you're talking about you've placed it on Amazon Prime, which it can be a combination of accessible to Prime members and transactional, where you have access to potentially millions and millions of consumers and put all your time and your energy into promoting that film on that platform. And instead of spending this, what I feel is good money after bad, you know, for often exorbitant fees, put that towards your marketing. Because what happens with most independent filmmakers is they, they, they sort of drop their wad on the, on the placement fees and they have, they don't have any money left for marketing and they're not savvy themselves in most cases in how to manage Mm -hmm. something like Facebook ads like that. And I, and I'll tell you for us, I got to tell you, love or hate Facebook on a personal level, they're, uh, their marketing division, the ability to do paid, targeted, marketed, boosted ads. I most, power, you, most, almost, most powerful marketing most machine ever created. Tool, but it's been a powerful tool. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's because we figured out how to maneuver it too. We deal with their algorithms. We deal with the things that we had to go through with what they said was okay or not okay to boost or promote and blah, 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 blah. So we're always managing sort of their ever-changing infrastructure as far as what's okay. But I got to tell you, phenomenal, phenomenal tool and something where you can do a $50 boost, a $75 boost, a $100 boost, a $500 boost, a $1,000 boost. You can put in the age range, the demographic. You can get as, as, as down to the cities. Then you can build in your hashtags, the likes, things that will all help that film, film's promo, end up in streams of potentially thousands and thousands of potential customers, right? So – it's 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 amazing to me that I don't see enough indie distributors even using that tool. Which what I find what I find fascinating. I've said this multiple times on the show, and I've and I I constantly say it. When you're going to launch a movie, if you're going to focus your energies and marketing muscle, don't spread it out over five or six platforms. Focus right. it on one platform at a time. Amazon arguably is the best place to put your movie right away because. Everyone generally has, in the North America at least, generally everyone has access to Amazon 
Amazon Prime or something along those lines. I forgot what the number was for Amazon Prime, but I think it's like 110 million people use in Amazon US. in the US in the US have Amazon Prime. <laughs> Right, it, right, I mean, right. and growing every day. They generate, I think, right. $53 billion or something ridiculous off of Prime or whatever right. that number is, $10 billion, right. whatever. So Amazon is, is no slack by any stretch if you focus it all completely on Amazon. And, Absolutely. you know, iTunes, eh, whatever. That's, uh, it's, a, it's a vanity exactly. platform. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. And then yeah. the smaller ones that people are like, I want to be on Xbox. I want to be on PlayStation. If I want to be on Fandango, those platforms are so minuscule. Yeah. Compared to Amazon, yeah. it's insane. Right. Or Google Play for what, that matter. And what you're saying is where I'm going. If you if you as an independent filmmaker, if you place your film just on Amazon, which you can do directly, at at, at almost no cost, right? And let's say that your film passes the <clears throat> content restriction. Uh, quality control that they do because there are films we've had a few uh it's you know everything's getting more pc these days where you know some films become what's called 18 and up so they won't allow you to place it on prime you only get you only get access to amazon instant video right so it's it's transactional but that depends if you have pretty you know intense content i mean for us as a horror film company especially mm -hmm. terror films label we've definitely had a couple of films that sort of you know <laughs> It's a, but would it's you recommend? But would you recommend then? You know, if, if for Vimeo, like something like Vimeo Pro or Vimeo Plus or something well, like that. Well, here's what I was going to go though. It's it's a it's it's in tune with your the other platforms we're talking about. So if you put everything on, if you put your film on on the Amazon Prime and promote that, and you hire a little PR team or a little marketing guy or a little digital marketing company to really help it get traction, and that film starts to make money, right? Starts to bring in the money. Well, now that you're seeing money come in. Take some of that money and now go hire a aggregation company if you want to be on Google or Xbox and you want to expand a little bit, right? Then, okay, I get it, right? But, but, but at least hedge your bets on one of the biggest platforms on the planet because if your movie is going to find an audience and start mm -hmm. to make money, Amazon Prime's probably one of your best bets. So why not give them – the shot first and, 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 and direct money into marketing efforts on that platform. Because even if you're not an Amazon prime member, anybody can go on Amazon and then pay a transactional fee to rent your film too. So you don't even have to, it's not just about tapping into Amazon prime subscribers where you're stuck with just the rev share model, right? You also have the ability to point people there just for a transactional buy. Right. And you can, you can list your transactional fee at, to rent your film at a dollar ninety nine, if you want to, right? So, so there's so many there's so many advantages for filmmakers to avoid, you know, spending too much money and having somebody else control their content and and more importantly control their revenue. Um, right. And again, I'm not not here to undermine aggregation services. I'm really not. We need them. We all need them. It's, 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 or, uh, it's, or, distri or distributors, good distributors like yourself. Like you're saying, like what you're telling them is basically a self distribution model. But, yeah. but, you know, when you are able to partner with someone that can bring value, and that's, I think, the biggest thing is if you're going to partner with a distributor, they have to provide value to you, meaning yeah. revenue, exposure, marketing muscle, being able to right. get you in a deeper into deeper markets like an Amazon, where you know if you do it yourself, right. you get two markets. If you go through a company, you might be able to get into much, many more yeah. markets in the world. There's yeah. so many different. Like, for, like, 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 for example, for us right now, I mean, we our dashboard is open to about 60 plus English speaking countries on the Amazon Prime right. world, right? So. Right. so and, and and the advantage to something like that is is when you talk about you know a company that supports the films like you can probably turn to any one of our filmmakers that it, and and I would I would even point to the filmmakers that have been with us for you know several years now because of our interest in what the way the model works and because we have skin in the game and because we pay for a trailer and we pay for a poster and we pay for the marketing and we pay for the publicist and we pay for the platform placement mm -hmm. and we absorb all of that you don't sit behind any of that. What it does is it actually I, – I hate to use this term, but it, it really does force our hand to do what we say we're going to do. No, of course. It's not only, it's not only in our contract, but but it, it's, it, it does sort of put us in a position where if we don't do what we say we're going to do. If we don't continue to market your films, we don't make any fucking money. We're going to close our doors. We're going to go under because we have skin in the game. We've spent thousands of dollars for every film just for its initial launch 
that the filmmaker doesn't sit behind. And so the benefit for a lot of our filmmakers and, and, and anybody following our social media page, I think specifically our Facebook page for Terror Films, we're always doing new promotions. There's going to be a new promotion dropping soon. We just did a, a 21 film placement with Roku. Right. That's a, that's that that we're going and most of them are library titles. There's only a couple of new titles that that's going to go out. We're going to promote the hell out of that. We're about to do a, a big uh, content deal with a, a streaming site called Horrify, and we're going to promote that. We're always coming back to our films this entire month, this entire month. We're doing something called um, uh, the ABCs of horror. So every single day we're promoting several films in alphabetical order from our library. We do a paid boosted ad on every single one of those. Most of these films are, are, are you know, library titles. They're not the new titles. The new titles, you know, but, but my point is we keep coming back to them. We're always promoting. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And part of that is also because what we've learned, and this has been from trial and error, of course, is that there's never there's never a bad time to find an audience in the digital sphere, right? There's I always mean, a new. There's always someone new. There's always somebody new. It's an opportunity where 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 the the audience and the consumer can find you. The other thing that we also do is that we're very active on social media with replying to customers. So when somebody drops something on our pages and says, "Oh, I really love this movie." We not only thank them, we encourage them to leave a review on the platform because the more good, positive reviews that get placed on the actual platforms automatically within the, in, in, the, in, in the infrastructure of the platforms raises those films up in a sort of a, an automatic promotion within the, the, the algorithms of the platform itself to consumers who may not have known about that film, may not have seen a promotional release or a trailer or any of the press that we did and go, oh, what's this film that that Amazon is promoting or that Voodoo is promoting or that whoever is promoting? And that's because we're encouraging those positive reviews because the more positive, more four and five star reviews you get, it's just going to raise to the to the, to the top of the heap. And we've had a situation too where we've had some films, bam, they burst out of the gate, Alex, and they start making money right away. Mm-hmm. We have other films, three, four, five quarters in – before they start to get traction. This is why we never stop promoting. It's why we never stop coming back to the films. So again, you know, I think for independent filmmakers, you know, it's, it's, you, you need to ask around, not just about aggregators, about distributors, but more importantly, this is an educational process. What I hope to have happened from this just mess with go digital distributor is that we get some change mm-hmm. to happen mm-hmm. and filmmakers understand that, aggregation to one extent from the delivery side is a necessary evil, but the collection of the royalties and the way that it happens needs to change. And this is affecting everybody. It's affecting everybody. And again, you know, what's difficult about what's happening with go digital distributor is that although they were a top aggregator for Netflix and a handful of the other platforms, they didn't have enough big accounts, right? So, so when I think about the noise that could be made, is that well, if if we ever find ourselves in a situation where one of the big ones, one of the ones that handles studio accounts, ever ends up in this place, and change hasn't happened by then, I bet your ass it's going to happen then. And my yeah. hope is that we wait for that. My hope is that we don't have to. To, 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 to get to that place. My, my hope is to make enough noise now. And listen, here's the thing. I'm going to piss a few people off, man. I already mm-hmm. have. I already mm-hmm. have. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm, not, I'm not here to give a shit about that. I'm not here to worry about the platform's feelings and aggregator's feelings. I'm here for the independent filmmaker. I'm here to say that something needs to change. I'm mm-hmm. here to say that these platforms are accountable and they need to make some very simple, basic changes on the financial side that will protect everybody. Protect everybody. And it's not a big ask. It's not even a big request. It's not even like being unreasonable, right? It's right. not even like I'm doing something so absurd that they're like, oh, God, he's crazy. He's out of his fucking mind. Mm-hmm. That's not – no. No, I'm asking for some fiduciary responsibility as it relates to our royalties. It was a – Come on, It was a system that was set up originally when this whole – It was. we're still very much in the wild, wild west. Of this time yeah. period, of the streaming time period, we're in the wild, wild west still. And when they first started coming up on these platforms, like iTunes, I think is the one that really got the ball rolling with the aggregators because Apple's Apple yeah. and they wanted to make sure. And then all the other platforms kind of piggybacked on that. It was a flawed system at the very beginning. They didn't look at the long game. They didn't look at the volume that there was going to be coming in. 
in the in the years to come. It was a flaw system when they started, and it's a flaw system now. And that is that is an example of so many things that we happen in our entire world, where whether it's you know burning gas all the <laughs> every single day, yeah. as opposed to yeah. going to an electrical car or whatever those you know whatever those those long term effects are. We're now feeling it here in our in our industry and there we're small enough of a boat because if you're a big carrier it takes forever to turn we're an industry that's small enough that we can make quick quick reactions uh to this sure. and and the, and the, and we're talking about a handful of companies and we're talking about you're not asking for anything that's unreasonable you know it's right. not like you're asking someone i need a i need a personal check develop a uh, delivered by somebody personally to me at my house every 15 right. days. Like I'm not, you, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not even asking that the platforms give everybody direct access to them. Right. right. All I'm saying, all I'm suggesting is that they pay set up an accounting infrastructure. That, oh, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Is that they set up an accounting infrastructure that allows the revenue to come directly to the content holder. Fair whether that's an individual filmmaker or whether that is uh, that is a distributor, end of story. I'll use your guys. I'll use your I'll use your platform delivery services all day long. But because it's just, but it's just a, and, that, and, and just stop it right there. It's like it's like saying you need to use this post house. That's fine because it's a yeah. service, and it should and our relationship should end there because it's not right. like it's it's like if I go to a post house for a color grading session, and it's not like after you're done, you deliver me the master. We're done. That's the right. end I of pay you for the service. You do the and service, our, and and then other than me needing you to fix something because we metadata is off, or yeah, at some point I decide I want to take the film down. Again, it's a service. You're not my banker. You're not a financial institution. You're not a collection account. Why are you collecting my money? Exactly. Why? Why platforms? And this has to change. And until enough filmmakers, aggregators, and distributors make noise, mm-hmm. we're not going to see change. Oh. And I'm, I'm hoping to be the guy who starts the noise. And I and I continue not to go uh, – I'm not going to go quietly into the night on this. I'm, I'm just not. Well, I'm not. It's um, going to be the last time you hear from me. Obvi- obviously, I'm, uh, I, I am as well not going to go quietly to the night. <laughs> Like I said earlier in my my broadcast today, I'm like I didn't sign up to be the poster boy for this damn thing, but hey, I'm here yeah. and I'll do it because yeah. it's right. It's the right thing to right. do, it's and the right thing. and you know what? When you have a platform or when you have knowledge, it's your responsibility to use it for the betterment of the community that you are serving, and that's the way I look at it. There's a lot of platforms out there, a lot of people in my space who haven't said a goddamn thing about this, right? And and a few of them jumped on after I said something. But I was right. the first one. I was the first one through the wall, and it was the reason because like I couldn't sit around. And you are arguably one of the the first distributors to really come out publicly and call everybody out on their stuff. You know, really heavily. You know, put it out there. So I applaud you for for coming on the show and and, and speaking your truth, sir, and uh, no, and, and helping uh, filmmakers uh, out. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for posting the letter. Um, you know, because I like I said, I, I I you know when I saw what was coming out. Um, and I saw how thin it was as far as the, the, the facts and the bigger picture and what the, what the core issue is, is, is why I felt like I can't, I just can't sit by and, and let everybody keep guessing. Um, and more importantly, I couldn't let everybody, yeah, I couldn't stand by and let everybody continue to make this about, oh, this is a filmmaker, independent filmmaker service issue only because it's not, it's not. And, and that. That's the story everybody needs to be talking about, and I really hope that uh, we see something really great from from IndieWire, um, who I've spoken to and given some information to, and mm-hmm. uh, and I'm hoping that the story continues to to get traction because, again, this has to end up at the doorsteps of the platforms. And I will say, on, on, on sort of a final note, I have been actually sending these emails, these links, and and when this podcast is is alive and available, I'm going to send it to the to the platforms directly and say, listen up. Pay attention. Pay attention. This needs to come your way. Mm-hmm. You need to talk internally. And we'll see what happens. We'll see what well, happens. But so, uh, I really want this to level off and I want people to take a deep breath 
And I want people to ultimately know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, but we have mm-hmm. to stick together as an independent community. Yes. Um, and, and we have to keep raising hell and we need to ask the questions and we need to not be afraid to piss people off, including the platforms and demand some change. Amen, brother. Preach, yeah. baby. Preach. Uh, now I am going to ask, I am going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests. Um, sure. what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Oh, God. I mean, I'll try and keep it simple. Um, one of the big conversations that we have on a pretty regular basis, and, and, and I'm going to really keep this about, about horror films specifically, but, sure. but it really kind of lends itself to any independent film. <clears throat> We're in a very interesting time where spending more does not mean anything, right? So this idea that you need to spend – millions of dollars on your film and you've got to try and get movie stars. It doesn't matter anymore, guys. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. It doesn't matter anymore. Uh, There was a time in this industry where if you had a certain level of name, you were guaranteed some pretty solid foreign sales. You were guaranteed maybe even some sort of limited theatrical Uh, those days are gone. Those days are really kind of non-existent. And look, all you have to do is pay attention to the major platforms. How many movies do you see every day? Big movies, big stars. They don't go to the theaters. They don't even get TV play. They're going straight to the platforms. Okay. There's a reason for that. And that's because consumers have changed the way people want to go see films, the way they want to ingest their content has changed. And when it comes to horror films specifically, listen, here's the number one rule. Make it scary, man. Make it scary. <laughs> Don't worry about using it. Don't worry about your, you know, I got to have big effects and I got to have all this, the bells and the whistles. Make a very good story and make it scary. And if it's an indie drama, make it compelling. If it's a comedy, make it funny, right? These are some very basic rules and keep it, and keep your budget as small as you possibly can. Because at the end of the day, if you can save some money to put into marketing, especially if you're self-distributing through one of these services, you know, then you give yourself an opportunity, right? Maybe you can give yourself a little four wall. Maybe you do yourself a little event theatrical through tug, uh, whatever it is. Maybe you swing the bats and then submit your film to AMC independent and see if they give you a handful of theaters, right? You know, there's so many ways to cut this and be smart about it and be smart about your investment. And I'm not saying don't make the movie you want to make. Listen, at the core of things as a filmmaker, you got to make the movie that you feel good about, that you can stand behind, but do your homework and pay attention. Cause sometimes, sometimes, just because you got money to make a movie doesn't mean you should make that movie. And you I, should think about that. I always <laughs> tell people if someone gave me a half a million dollars today, I would make five to ten movies. <laughs> I would right? make I would make five to ten <laughs> movies. <laughs> I mean, I'm being honest. You diversify that portfolio and you have a much you're, instead of swinging once, you swing five to ten times. Chances are right. something's you're going to get a, you're going to get a much better hit out of that. But that's 100%. just me. <laughs> no, no, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. I agree with that. <laughs> now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Oh, wow. Uh, in the film business, um, <laughs> it took me a while to learn that uh, nobody knows shit. And that is the absolute truth. <laughs> as, as, William Go- as William Goldman so perfectly said, nobody knows nothing. <laughs> I, I don't care – who you are on the food chain and what part of the industry you're in. You don't know a goddamn thing. You don't know who's going to be the next big star. Mm -hmm. You don't know whose movie is going to be a success. You don't know what script's going to work. You don't know anything. You don't know anything. What we're all doing at the highest levels, all the way up to the major studio execs, the biggest producers and directors in town, is we are taking educated guesses. That's what we're doing. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. all we're doing. Now, some of those educated guesses are more informed uh, and based on more experience than others. But at the end of the day, that's all they are. Because, if, if again, if we had a crystal ball, if we knew, do you think there'd be another studio that spent $150 million on a movie and another $100 million on, on P&A and the film still fell in its face? They would have made that movie if they knew that was going to happen? No, of course not. They hedge their bets, right? And that's all we're doing in this industry. So – Although vetting is important and getting feedback is important and getting advice is important, take it all in and then and then divest, you know, get rid of what doesn't matter and 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 stick to what feels good to you. Because at the end of the day, 
you got to go with your gut and you got to go with your instincts um, and you got to try and make them educated. But that's all they are. They're just guesses. Nobody knows anything. Nobody knows anything. And that 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 took me years to really understand, including for myself. I mean, if mm-hmm. I'm being honest for myself to be able to know that my biggest advantage is knowing what I don't know and mm-hmm. and importantly, not being afraid to ask questions, not being afraid to ask for help, not being afraid to ask for for for, for advice. And and even as 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 I think as savvy as I can be in many aspects of this business, <clears throat> which took a lot of years and a lot of learning curves and, and, mm-hmm. and certainly was a lot of mistakes. There's still times that I, 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 I don't get it right. Or sometimes I have to ask for, for somebody's input or a colleague's input or for an opinion. And there's no shame in that. In fact, I think there's empowerment in that. I think when you are, you are smart enough to know that you don't know it all and that you don't have all the answers <laughs> and that you need to ask for help. There's power in that. Don't feel weak in that. Don't feel like you, 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 you're, you're, you're somehow inferior because you have to ask for help or ask for an opinion or ask we for something. We, we all have to ask for help. We all have to ask for opinion. If you're humble enough and, and, and just understand that you know nothing and that your, your cup is never full, it will always right. be, it will always be filled up. It's like that Zen master says is like, your cup is full. Why are you coming to me? I can't fill it. You've already know everything. Why should you talk to me? You should always have that empty, empty cup feeling. Yeah, and I think the problem though is, and you 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 could probably attest to this. I mean, this is a business built on egos, right? No, and, and most, stop it, and most, stop it, <laughs> stop it. Well, and wait, let me go further. Most of the egos are fragile, right? No, so, so, so stop so, it. You know, I don't believe you. I don't when, believe when you. When you're dealing with that, it's really it's really a tough. Sometimes <laughs> it's very tough to get out of your own way. Even sometimes the most yeah. intelligent people have a hard time getting out of their own way. Um, until, until the industry, you know, kicks them in the head. And that's the other thing too, is important to know about this business. It doesn't give a shit about you. Oh, it doesn't no. care. No. And, and even if you have a hit, let's say you have a hit movie or a hit series. Doesn't matter. Great. You're hot for that minute. Now, when that movie's gone and that series is off the air, now it's time to prove that it wasn't a fluke. Now you actually have to work harder to show this business that you didn't just get lucky. Right. And that you can continue that success. And now you think you worked hard to get to the first hit? Try getting to the second hit, all right? It's even that much harder, right? Um, And I think that that's really important for for everybody to know. And I don't care, again, I don't care who you are. You could be an indie filmmaker. You could be the the president of Warner Brothers. You don't know everything. You don't. Look, look, there's there's certain directors that you and I grew up with that were the biggest, most powerful, most amazing artists, and now they're not financed. They're not making yeah. movies today in the studio system because they're just not. So it doesn't matter. All of everybody has their time. Look, like I always use that, that example, the Spielberg couldn't get Lincoln, you know, financed. It, you know, he had to go, you know, he barely got his movie financed. And right. even, even better example, Schindler's List, he paid for himself because right. nobody would give him money for it. And that was Spielberg, you right. know. And, and let's talk just for a real quick second about someone like uh, Megan Ellison and 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 Anna Pora, right? Mm-hmm. Who has been such an advocate of of cultivating art house filmmakers. But let's face it, she made some big bets on some not great choices. That now she's her company's restructuring; they're rethinking everything they're doing. And and I'm not saying that as a negative because I, I have such love and respect for a company like that 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 did did that took so many chances on independent filmmakers and and essentially took independent filmmakers but gave them like a forty million dollar budget right <laughs> and, Sc- and, and scary and sometimes company, scary sometimes but she, she her company paid for that right her, her company paid for that 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 those decisions and I and I, I use as an example here's somebody you know billionaire family didn't know it all. Took some, took some, took some pretty hefty bets, and 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 got kicked in the face a couple of times, more than a couple of times on the financial side. So even she's learning and restructuring and redoing. So again, it just goes back to what I keep saying: is that nobody knows anything. We're all we're all taking guesses and 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 swinging the bats. Now, uh, three of your favorite films of all time. Oh, three of my favorite films of all time. I would say that uh, uh, Goodfellas is definitely up there as as, as probably one I am of the lo- best. I, I, I am looking forward to the $150 million epic Irishman, that's going, oh, yeah. which is going straight to streaming on Netflix. Well, actually, no. no it will no, go I theatrical. Just, it will go theatrical. I just read they're giving it like a 24-day theatrical before but, it hits streaming. Uh, we'll but, see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah. 
But it goes to show you, though, it goes back to, the, to our earlier conversation. It goes to show you that the level of film is going to – this is Martin Scorsese. This no, is Martin this Scorsese is the with Robert De Niro, stars, Joe Pesci, right, and Al Pacino. The biggest star in the industry, yeah. and they all signed up for a movie that's predominantly going straight to, to streaming right, yeah, for yeah. the most part because that's just where the business is. That, that, that's who's supporting. I mean, look, Martin Scorsese with that cast couldn't get a studio to write the check. That's the truth. I mean, right. let's talk about why he went to Netflix. It wasn't because he w- was like, yeah, I want to be on Netflix. I want to go straight to streaming. It was because nobody was going to write that check. No, the studio wasn't going to write that because Robert De Niro wasn't playing a superhero, right? <laughs> like, let's just, let's just call it what it is, right? right, right. That's the truth. That's the truth. Um, I would say that The Usual Suspects is another movie Good for me. Amazing uh, movie. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big, 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 big fan of, and, uh, I'm actually going to, uh, go on a little bit of a limb here and say there was an independent film called Elizabeth blue. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Uh, that, that really was a beautiful film that was, uh, that was written and directed by actually my husband. And it was based on, on our true experience and, and got a lot of, Got a lot of love and actually got our unknown actress on the variety dark horse list for the Oscars, uh, nice. which was pretty cool. We put that out in 2017. And so I, I, I only say that because it's not something I say often or lightly, but it was a film that was so beautiful and near and dear to my heart. Uh, oh, that's that, awesome. uh, it really touched me. So, but anyway, yeah. that's, that's awesome, dude. And uh, where can people find you and your company, what you do? So you can go to uh, our websites are probably the easiest, which is uh, terrorfilms.net or mm-hmm. globaldigitalreleasing.com, uh, where you can see our library. You can see a little bit about us. You can see a little bit about our, our, our model. Um, and uh, it's pretty straightforward. Or any of our social media pages, which are pretty straightforward, Terror Films or Global Digital Releasing. And – you know, we're, we're, we're a super transparent company and, 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 you know, I have these conversations all the time with filmmakers that are, that are when films come our way that we're interested in, whether it's through a sales rep or a film festival or an individual filmmaker, you know, the biggest part of the conversation I have on a regular basis is I say, first of all, I give them a very honest landscape about, you know, releasing about what it's going to look like, what it's going to be, what we're going to do. But what, what I always say before I hang up on that call is I say, listen, even if you loved everything I said, even if you've gotten recommended by three or four people that are with us to come to our company, I encourage you to talk to any distributor expressing interest in your film. Talk to all of them. Ask them all the questions. Look at their libraries. Look at what they're doing. More importantly, look at their long form because a lot of times, too, what I, always, what I take a lot of pride in is what we tell filmmakers that we do and about our model, it's in our agreement. It's mm-hmm. actually in the long form. Word for word in black and white. If somebody's telling you a bunch of nonsense and giving you a song and a dance and all this wonderful stuff, that's great. If it ain't in their long form, it doesn't mean shit because it doesn't mean they have to do it. They don't have to do it. They don't have a legal responsibility whatsoever to do anything that they told you on a phone call. So that is a big thing that I pride ourselves in is, is, is the transparency of being a company comprised of independent filmmakers who have been through this nonsense, who are going through this nonsense now with Go Digital Distributor. We're right there with you and we're fighting hard and we're giving people education and giving people tools. And I think that we're all going to come out on the other side of this. It's going to be rough. It's going to be a rough probably few months for everybody. Mm. Um, but the dust will settle and we will be on the other side of this and, mm-hmm. and, and, and we will be a better, ideally a better community for it. I, I, I do believe that. And that's, I think that's our biggest goal here with, with the go digital distributor debacle is, is how do we, how do we become a better community of independent filmmakers and independent distributors and and how do we how do we maybe make some change uh, that's for the better for everybody? Joe, man, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show, and thank you again for being so raw and honest and transparent uh, about you know sounding the the alarm on not just go digital distributor, but also on the much larger problem that needs to be fixed for us to move forward as a community and as a business. So thank you, brother, for for doing Michael. that, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, buddy. Again, I really want to thank Joe for being so straightforward, so honest, so raw, so transparent about what's going on with this whole distributor 
film aggregator thing that is happening to our industry and to our uh, to a lot of filmmakers. Now it's affecting a lot of filmmakers, and now he's coming forward and really, really putting out there some very interesting theories about what could have possibly happened. Just what ifs, if you will, of what could have happened to it. Uh, the math does not seem to make any sense. So. We'll see what happens as things continue to move forward. Now, if you haven't heard already, I did do a Facebook update, uh, Facebook Live update earlier this morning, and I will put that video in the links or links to that video in the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 352, as well as links to contact Joe, Terra Films, and also links to the prior podcasts and videos that we've put out there discussing this go digital distributor debacle. Now, I am continually talking about this on the show and bringing new elements into the show because it is an ever growing story and it is affecting thousands and thousands of filmmakers. And there, this is a moment in time where we really need to see what happened, how we can protect ourselves in the future, and so on. So, I do have other episodes coming up next week that are not relative to the whole go digital distributor thing, but I do want to keep an eye on this and also want to keep a focus, a a spotlight on this topic because it is so, so important, especially going into AFM in November. And by the way, I will be at AFM this year, the American Film Market. I will be there a bunch this year. So if you want to reach out to me, you want to grab a cup of coffee or anything like that, just IM me, email me, we'll set something up. I'll be at the Lowe's uh, walking around doing things, taking meetings and so on. So I'd love to hang out with the tribe. If there's a whole bunch of you, maybe we'll do a little you know, meet up somewhere at one of the local bars or coffee joints or something like that. So please let me know. Reach out to me. I want to talk and help as many filmmakers as I possibly can while I'm there. So thanks again, guys, for listening. Also, guys, if you have any questions at all about the Make Your Movie Bootcamp, please just email me at bootcamp at IndieFilmHustle.com. I really do want to make this an insane, insane time. Pack as much information as I can for you in this amazing uh, two-day intensive that I'll hold in Burbank. We will have some special guests come in, some industry heavy hitters that are going to be dropping major knowledge bombs on you guys as well. And there might be a few other surprises in there as well, because I do, like I said in my last uh, podcast earlier this week, or actually yesterday, which is, I do believe that the future of independent filmmaking is going to be the film entrepreneurial model, the entrepreneurial filmmaker. That is what's going to survive beyond all this other craziness that's going on. Those, those basic pillars of being a film entrepreneur will be, in my opinion, the future of what what filmmakers, are, how they can survive in this ever-changing landscape called independent filmmaking and the film business in general. And if you want to pre-order my book, which is going to come out November 7th, it's called Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, How to Turn Your Independent Film into a Money-Making Business. Just go over to filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book. Dot com pre-order it. We are going to be selling it on paperback. You can pre-order the ebook, uh, the ebook version as well. And I will be, I'm going to do my best to get the audiobook out sooner rather than later. So thank you again so so much for all the support, guys. If you have any questions, you have any stories, all any of that kind of stuff, please email me, message me, hit me up on Facebook, Twitter, wherever. I do check all that stuff. So Thanks again for listening, guys. I hope this episode was of value to you. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.